everybody. Let's go ahead and get started with this presentation on awe, wonder, and empowerment. Briefly, we're going to explore how awe and wonder can enhance feelings of personal empowerment and reduce distress. And yeah, there's actually research on it, so that's kind of cool. When people feel distressed, they often feel disempowered and hopeless. Well, that's kind of common sense. Distress triggers the amygdala and the HPA axis and propels people into default mode responding. We talked about that earlier, that default mode is the action. It's when you are just responding to escape from the threat. It's not, you're, you're not thinking, you're on autopilot. <clears throat> Mindfulness, sometimes spurred by awe, awe and wonder, downregulates the default mode network and enhances and activates the executive control network which allows people to become aware of possibilities and options. So the default mode network, remember, <clears throat> when it kicks in, it bases all of its decisions, if you will, on prior schema. It doesn't take current context into consideration and say, well, does this really fit? It just bases its uh, actions on current schema. When you're driving up to a stoplight, you see it turn yellow, your default mode kicks in and says, well, that sucker's gonna turn red in a minute, so you better, you know, depending on who you are, either floor it or hit the brakes. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and that's, that's not conscious thought that goes into that. You're just kind of on autopilot. When we become mindful, then we are encouraging our brain to engage the executive control network and explore the current situation in context. You know, yes, we have all of the information from prior experiences. We have all those schema, but the executive control network wants to add to, or at least verify the accuracy of that schema. All experiences can be characterized uh, as a perceived vastness, profoundness, or greatness, and a need for accommodation or an adjustment of our understanding of the world. So when we experience awe, a lot of times it's things that we don't really have an answer to or that are just mesmerizing. And I think, you know, most of us have had at least an awe experience whether it's been a double rainbow or a meteor shower or just being outside um, at night and seeing all the stars. Um, I remember being on the boat with my grandfather when I was a little girl and we would go out on the bow and when you're out, and this was in the Atlantic Ocean, um, but when you're out in the ocean in the middle of in the middle of the night, the stars look so close. It looks like you can almost touch them. And I remember that being very awe-inspiring for me. Um, and still, when I go out, you know, we live on a farm, so obviously there's not a lot of ambient light at night. Uh, so we see a lot of stars where we're at. But I remember it being much more palpable, if you will, when it felt like I could almost catch one. People, when they experience awe, switch from default mode to executive control. Their brain is just stops for a second and says, wow, let me take all of this in. You know, I don't want to be thinking about all this other stuff that's going on. And this is different than a prior experiences. I want to be in the moment. When people feel awe, their attention becomes focused on something extraordinary, and it can be thought of as a temporary form of mindfulness. When you feel awe, you often want to continue to experience it, to see it again, and maybe, but not always, understand it. When people have awe experiences, they often have a release of dopamine, they have a release of serotonin and sometimes endorphins when it's just, when it's majestic, when it's beautiful, when it's phenomenal. I mean, the awe experiences tend to 
require words like that as opposed to, yeah, it was fine, or it was good, or yeah, it was. Um, when people experience awe, they try to find words that are sufficiently representative. And that can be an interesting activity to do in group. If you show people a video or if you have the funding at your clinic to allow them to experience virtual reality, um, or even if it's just something outside, experiencing that and then having them describe it and trying to find words that adequately fit what was going on. Dasher Keltner, a psychologist at UC Berkeley, has shown that awe leads to greater humility, curiosity, innovation, happiness, and a desire to contribute to the world. So awe actually alters our brain chemistry and our cognitive processes in some ways. Sometimes it can help us feel a little bit more insignificant, which can sometimes make things that seem like big problems right now not seem like such big issues because we're looking at this thing that is so enormous or so magnificent in front of us. In two studies, a typical awe experience was associated not only with awe, but also with compassion, gratitude, love, and optimism, along with connectedness and self-relevant thoughts. So I want you to think for a second about your awe experiences and, you know, have they, when you have them, have they made you at least for a moment feel a greater sense of connectedness to your world, to your universe, a greater sense of gratitude, love, optimism? You know, how did your awe experience impact you? I know sometimes I mentioned earlier that I garden and I will look at those seeds and I've been gardening for over a decade. So I know it works. I know if I plant this little tiny seed in the soil, I'm going to get this great big plant that has all this fruit on it. You know, I'm thinking of green peppers at the moment, but um, <clears throat> I still to this day look at it and I look at this little seed and it's almost incomprehensible to me how something that small can become something that big and that wonderful. Um, and I know that's um, interest, a little bit different, but yes. And, and Claudia points, points out that a lot of times we feel that way after we, um, when we have children. And, and we're seeing this little being in our hands and we're just like, how? I mean, we can look, read the biology books and we can understand how all these th things happen, but understanding it and comprehending it, understanding it from a, a technical perspective, you know, I can tell you all the different steps that have to go on, but actually wrapping my head around it and recognizing that it happens um, can be so different. Um, and yes, LaVon, you're correct. Uh, it can be a negative experience also. Um, some of your experiences that um, produce awe are can make you feel small and sometimes feeling small and not in control of everything can be a very scary experience. Awe is a, a complex emotional construct characterized by a mix of positive feelings like contentment and happiness and wonder and sometimes negative affective components like fear and a sense of being smaller humbler or insignificant. Now, part of it is how you phrase it or how you embrace terms like insignificance. You know, sometimes 
when you feel like you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders um, and you feel like everything you do is going to make or break everything, recognizing that you don't have control of everything can sometimes be a relief. Sometimes it can help cause people to spiral more, but a lot of times it can help people gain a different perspective. Um, and these studies that were done were, were kind of interesting to see exactly how much people changed in their responses to the questionnaires that they were given after the awe experience, which makes you think that encouraging people to seek out awe experiences can be extremely beneficial. Going, for example, going hiking. And we have, where we're at, um, there are a bunch of waterfalls around. And you see these amazing waterfalls and they're just breathtaking to see. And that experience actually does modify your neurons a little bit. And so when you're doing that, not only are you having that momentary awe experience, but it also does improve compassion, gratitude, optimism. So what a great way to recharge your positivity battery, if you will, um, than to try to seek out awe experiences. Now, yes, looking at a waterfall or a, or a meteor shower or whatever is not going to solve the problems that you've got in your temporal life. Um, but it gives you a momentary break. It gives your brain a momentary break to go, okay, let me regroup. <clears throat> Humility is a foundational virtue that counters selfish inclinations like entitlement and arrogance. The realization that there is more beyond the self and one's impact on the world and the world's impact on them. When we become humble, part of humility can be recognizing that that wasn't all my fault. There were other factors at play. Imagine that. Um, and that can be very liberating for a lot of people who tend to try to take responsibility for everyone and everything. When they start recognizing that there's more out there, there are lots of factors at play. How else can humility <clears throat> be helpful in treatment? And I'm not talking about humiliation. That's totally different. I'm talking about recognizing, being humble, recognizing that we're not perfect. And is it possible to foster empowerment and humility at the same time? Oh, congratulations, Rachel. That's awesome. personally think, and, and while you guys think about your responses, I'll, sh I'll share mine. Um, I personally think that we can foster empowerment and humility at the same time because we are, um, humility encourages us to be aware of what we do and do not have control over. But empowerment encourages us to take control of the things that we do have control over. So empowerment means recognizing and using our energy effectively to address our environment um, while recognizing that there are some things that it's like trying to move a house by pushing on it with your shoulder. It just ain't ever gonna work. <clears throat> and you can, yeah. It, I, I agree, Rachel, you can gain knowledge when you become more humble, when you don't think like you've got all the answers, when you step back and become more humble and aware, you can take in more information. A lot of times when people are more humble, they're more willing to ask 
you know, for input. They're ask for feedback, ask for guidance. So we do gain information and input. And one of the cool things about that is they've done studies and they've shown that relationships are strengthened when people feel like they can be helpful. So a lot of times we think that we strengthen relationships by helping somebody. But there's also a um, opposite effect when people feel like they've been able to help you, that they feel closer to you, they feel more connected to you. Humility can help us open, be open to others and ideas and can help people become their more authentic selves. Very true. Um, so humility does have a place. And like we've talked about in other segments today, there are, there's a lot of bad feeling around the word humility because people automatically often think humiliation instead of humble. Um, so that's an important thing I find when I, when I do exercises about humility in group. Um, I usually talk about being humble uh, because humility has such a bad connotation to it. When individuals counter something that is vast and challenges their worldview, they may feel awe, which leads to self-diminishment and subsequently humility. Awe-prone individuals were rated as more humble by their friends. So this is kind of an interesting uh, thing and I, I know it to be true or I, I've seen it uh, be true because my, my best friend from college she was one of those people that found awe everywhere I mean nothing was ever good or fine it was always fabulous or amazing I mean she was just such an intense person and but it was always a positive intensity and she saw the beauty in most everything, if not everything. I can't, she was a very positive person, but she also was very humble and she recognized, you know, there are some really beautiful things. There are some wonderful things. I had nothing to do with it, but I'm going to partake in it. Um, so it was interesting to see how being open, I mean, she, I think she was like 24 seven in open awareness meditation because she was just, she would drink in everything, the world. And it was really fascinating and energizing in a lot of ways to be around her because nothing was just eh. There was always intensity behind it. Inducing awe led participants to present a more balanced view of their strengths and weaknesses to others and to acknowledge the contribution of outside forces in their own personal accomplishments. Um, and I'll ask you to think about how could you do this in session? Um, but when I talk, when I think about awe, one of the things and I think about and I'm sure there have been other people since. I don't really follow football all that much now that I'm not at, uh, in college. But when I was in college, we had a player by the name of Emmett Smith, which a lot of you may recognize the name. That man, when he would run, it was just phenomenal. It was breathtaking to see, and, and you can go back, you can go on YouTube and you can see some of the highlights from his career, um, both in college as well as when he was playing pro. But it was like poetry in motion to watch this man play. And it was awesome to see some of those things, but also to recognize, you know, the contribution of the team, you know, they had to make it they had to get him the ball and they had to make it so he could run. Um, but also prior contributions, you know, the support the, that he had had, the coaches that had helped him learn to be so situationally aware um, that got him to that point. Um, and a lot of really good athletes recognize that it's not just them, you know, it's 
They give credit to their teammates, to their coaches, to their parents who got them to practice, you know, every single day when they were in, you know, peewee football or whatever. Um, so that's where that awe comes from, um, or what awe can do when people recognize um, the contribution. You know, you look at Emmett Smith and you go, how in the world did this person develop where they could do these things? And you start thinking, you know, is it something that he just woke up one morning and all of a sudden he could run a whatever and a whatever? I, again, I told you I don't follow football much anymore. But, um, and even watching the Olympics, and I didn't watch much of them this year, but I enjoy watching them because it's awe inspiring. You watch them and it's like, wow, look what a human being is capable of doing. So all that to say, how can we help people induce awe in session so they can start experiencing it? Another study that they did on awe and wonder found that inspiring awe made subjects feel more skeptical of weak or vague arguments and sought, seek a clearer understanding of what they were actually experiencing. So whether it's childbirth or meteor showers or, oh my gosh, if you've ever seen a, a killer whale or um, something like jump in the ocean, you know, that's kind of awe inspiring. And you may want to understand what, what you're seeing. Experiencing awe can dampen the body's stress response and can change how people process information. Big things may not seem as big anymore, and little things we take for granted may start to seem more important. Um, and Rachel points out that we can have clients in session talk about their strengths and point out the positives that they may not have recognized. We can also help them talk about experiences and also recognize things that they may be taking for granted in that. And sometimes having people, it can be an awe-inspiring personal experience when they realize how far they've come in therapy, you know, that's what we're talking about right now, but whether it's physical therapy or mental health counseling or whatever, you know, if you see the same thing day after day, you may not notice the incremental changes, but over time, they are there. And we were talking about children earlier. If you're a grandparent and you don't see your grandchild every single day, then when you see them in six months or a year, you are awestruck by how much they've grown and how different they look and all of that stuff. As a parent, I mean, you kind of notice it as you're going through day by day, but it's not as stark a contrast because you see them literally every single day. Um, and you know, one day you wake up and you may look at them and go, I've got a toddler, you know? <laughs> Where did my little baby boy go? Or maybe that was just me. But um, you know, all experiences come in a variety of different packages. Awe encourages you to gather information about what's actually there in the moment. So let's take a grandchild. You know, a lot of times one of the things that the... Uh, a gra grandparent will do is say, come here, let me take a look at you. Oh my gosh, tell me what's going on. Let me understand all the changes since the last time I saw you. Um, and we may do the same thing when we're seeing a meteor shower or something. Awe can be a catalyst for advancement as well, because sometimes we see things we don't understand and we want to understand how did that work? Um, I was at the gym today. They had on a, a 
TV program, and they didn't have the sound on, so it, I only caught part of what was going on. But they were basically they discovered that they can use porcupine quills, and they are stronger sutures than the staples that they're using, and they're able to um, more effectively hold on to tissue without ripping it. Um, and I thought that was fascinating. Um, not that I'm ever going to do surgery, but it was just one of those things that made me wonder, wonder how that works. And all of those things can be a catalyst for advancement. If we look around and we go, why does one person develop addiction and the other person doesn't? You know, it's in a way kind of awe-inspiring when you think of you know, there are these differences, how our brain works. That's just enough. Um, <clears throat> so why do people not engage in awe experiences? Well, some people say they're too busy. They may be too busy putting one foot in front of the other in that default mode to even notice what's going on kind of around them. I try to be mindful when I'm driving to work in the morning um, and when I'm coming home at night, but especially in the morning because the little critters are out. And I guess it was a week or so ago, I was driving to work and there was a doe and what looked like an hour's old fawn sitting right next to her. And it was just the most beautiful sight that I saw pretty much all day, I think. Um, but, if I had been too busy, if I had been thinking about everything that I needed to do at work and everything else, I might not have noticed that. Some people have difficulty experiencing awe because they are depressed. They just don't have enough dopamine and, and endorphins to get that surge going. And in early recovery from addictions, a lot of people really struggle with the grays. Um, they have difficulty experiencing emotions very much. They feel very flat most of the time. Uh, so trying to encourage them to experience awe can actually be counterproductive. So I'm not saying this is necessarily an intervention for everybody because we don't want set, to set people up to get frustrated. Um, and, and that's something important to remember that not everybody can feel awe. Um, and, and it's important to, to take that under consideration. For others, they may want, not want to look for awe experiences because it may be too threatening to recognize that there's something bigger than them or see others' successes. You know, they, instead of seeing Emmett Smith run and be awe-inspired, they see it and they feel envious and jealous and resentful. Um, and, and it's important to process those things and explore where that comes from. What else might keep people from being able to notice or appreciate awesomeness? And here's that quote that I was telling you about earlier while you're thinking about the answer to that question. Um, people on the spectrum can feel awe and wonder as well as a host of other things. Uh, they may have dif difficulty identifying the feelings or manifest them differently than somebody who is neurotypical. Uh, many feelings such as anger, fear, and joy seem to be experienced more intensely by those with Asperger profiles than by neurotypical people and maybe um, so this is on the Asperger Autism Network and it's a really interesting article on people on the spectrum and empathy but obviously that that's linked off of your PowerPoint as well oops wonder how I did that um, So how do we trigger awe? Well, what is awe inspiring to you? And one of the, um, 
And LaVon raises a good question before we go on to identifying awe-inspiring experiences. Not only can certain physiological and mental health conditions prevent people from being able to experience awe, but some medications do too. Um, uh, when my son was young, for a brief period, he was on medication for ADHD. And, you know, yes, it helped him focus at school and everything, but I remember one day very distinctly, um, my daughter came out. They used to play together incessantly and announced to me that it was time for Sean to start doing his lessons. And I was like, well, that doesn't sound like your place, little girl. Um, and she said, I said, how do you know it's time for Sean to do his lessons? And she said, his imagination's gone. His medication kicked in. I was like, oh, well, I don't like that. <laughs> I didn't say that to her, but that's what I thought to myself that, you know, when his medication kicks in, his imagination goes away. Um, so it is important to recognize, my point being, that there are certain medications that can dampen people's endorphin response. <clears throat> so what is awe-inspiring? Pregnancy, for, for me, um, my list included pregnancy and babies. Not just how they go from being, you know, two independent cells to this little creature and going from not breathing air to breathing air, which is really cool in and of itself, but just watching them grow and thinking about how does a cell know whether it's supposed to become a fingernail or hair or a part of the heart? You know, all of those things, when I start thinking about the development of living organisms, I can get sidetracked for quite a while. Plants, we already talked about. Caterpillars. I find the way that caterpillars wrap themselves in a cocoon and then suddenly like turn to gush and emerge in, as a butterfly. Fascinating. You know, why is it that that one particular creature does that? And none of the rest of us do. Um, rainbows, sunsets, the universe, cosmos, the beauty of a perfect athletic uh, performance, dinosaurs. You know, I'm not real into dinosaurs, but dinosaurs are cool. I mean, they don't exist anymore. But then there are creatures like the, uh, the possum that actually did exist back when the dinosaurs were alive. How'd that happen? Neuropsychology, the way our brain or neuropsychiatry, neurology, whatever, uh, the way our brain works. We don't even completely understand it yet. So it's fascinating to see all of the different components that go together to produce thought and emotion and even regulate physiological functioning. Tornadoes, fires, tsunamis, you know, natural phenomena, if you will. <clears throat> um, volcanoes. I think a lot of us, not that we want to be in one, but watching a video of one and seeing the sheer power of it um, can be very awe-inspiring. Skydiving, spacewalking, virtual reality can be awe-inspiring. Um, just figuring out how they can actually trick our brain into thinking that we are somewhere. The technology that goes behind it or you can use virtual reality to inspire awe. Um, they actually do have really good programs out now that are very lifelike. I mean, you kind of feel like you're in on a beach in Fiji or wherever. Um, and that can actually be great for helping people in the recovery process. And we're going to talk about that more tomorrow, um, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but VR ha definitely has some interesting applications to it. And personal growth and progress. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of times people don't recognize it because they see themselves day in and day out. But personal growth, um, if you track it and people can look back after 
three weeks or 30 days and go, wow, look how far I've come. It can be very awe inspiring because a lot of times when they start treatment, they don't have a lot of faith or confidence that things will get better. They have a little bit or they wouldn't be in session, but it helps to bolster their uh, motivation if you can inspire awe and help them see how far they've come. What other things are awe inspiring to you? The ocean. The ocean is very amazing. Um, I remember going snorkeling when I was when I was younger. Now I'm like terrified of sharks. I have this irrational fear of sharks. Um, so I've never gone scuba diving, but the ocean is just phenomenally beautiful. And some of the creatures, um, <clears throat> we used to watch all those shows on the Nature Channel um, when my kids were little. And you know, some of the creatures that live down in the deep dark depths that are um, that actually glow in the dark and stuff. I thought uh, they're really cool. How do how these organisms adapt to their particular environment? Um, and the resilience of some people after trauma um, can also be very awe inspiring. Seeing how somebody bounces back is inspirational. Um, you're right, uh, Lizanne, I hadn't really thought about that, but people showing kindness and helping each other is very awe inspiring. So think about times. I mean, there are times you look at something and you're like, wow. But there are times where you see something that is very sweet and you go, oh, well, guess what? That was an awe experience. Sit with it for a minute. Um, mountains, trees, nature, those things generally come up as awe experiences. So those are all things that you can pull from. Um, if you're going to encourage people to try to integrate all experiences into their life, it can be helpful to bring those, uh, encourage them to make a list of things that they would find awe inspiring. <laughs> explaining physics to elementary school kids or heck explaining physics to somebody my age can be, uh, very awe inspiring because it reminds us of how much how much we really don't know or how much we do know and just how confusing it can kind of be like you're talking about with gravity and how we don't just fly off the earth if you work with kids or even if you work with adults. <laughs> this handout is, and again, it's linked off the PowerPoint, promoting awe and wonder in children. <clears throat> it encourages us to revisit our own magic moments from our childhood. Um, what things do you remember that were just, you know, highlights, if you will. Um, spend time in nature, Become, become a lifelong student of nature. Photography can be great for awe and inspiration, taking pictures of things so you can blow them up and see them in more detail, um, or you can get a little closer to them because you can only get so close to a, a bee on a flower most of the time before it flies off. Uh, videos can be helpful because you not only see, but you hear. And that is one of the really interesting things with um, Google Earth, because you can transport yourself virtually to a lot of different places. Now, seeing the Grand Canyon on Google Earth is not the same as seeing it in person. You don't feel nearly as insignificant when you see it on your computer screen. But there are other things that you can immerse yourself in um, that can inspire that awe experience. And I'm really looking forward to the day when we all have the ability to have 
virtual reality, at least one set of virtual reality goggles in our house so we can tap into those awe experiences, so we can feel like we are deep under the sea and see the fish swimming around or what have you. But that's just me. Um, spend time with children. That's another way to um, inspire awe in yourself because children, since a lot, they haven't experienced near as many things as you have, they are struck by awe and wonder all the time. I remember going to the Natural History Museum with my son, well, any museum with my son, bless his heart. I mean, the child would just drink up everything and it was hard to keep up with him when he'd get into the museum. He would be going from this exhibit to the other exhibit and reading this and learning that. And it was, could be a little exhausting, but it was awesome to see him get so incredibly excited. And then he would talk about it for days afterwards. So he was learning, he was ga gaining more information and he was appreciating things that normally he may not never get exposed to. But children will ask questions that indicate their awe, you know, why do spiders do this? So there, there was one um, video by the National Wildlife Association um, and the little girl, I'll have to see if I can find it on break, but the little girl was asking her dad a bunch of questions about nature and um, it showed that she was kind of awestruck by things that she didn't understand. Um. Other things that we can do, as I said, try to see the world through a child's eyes. Um, going to the planetarium, a museum, nature walk, seek it out in person, in media or virtual reality. Journal about it. 10 minutes of awe during the day and 10 minutes of positive focus at night. So journaling about something that you had an awe experience with um, each day. And maybe it's not something that you experienced that day. Hopefully it is even if it means, you know, looking at a video on YouTube or something, or um, um, what is it? Uh, it's not Discovery Channel anymore. It um, starts with a C, I can't remember, but it's another channel that has um, Curiosity Stream, has a lot of documentaries on it. Um, and that can help us get that awe experience and then at night, 10 minutes of positive focus. And when I, I don't want to talk about to toxic positivity where you're pretending everything's great, but recognizing that in the midst of the things that didn't go well, recognizing the things that did go well and how well you coped with life as it came at you today. Another way to trigger awe and wonder is to tell someone about how they made a big impact on you. And that triggers awe in them and reflect on how that experience impacts you. Uh, I know there, there have been times where I've gone back and I've t told teachers or whatever um, the impact that they have had on my life. And I could see that it resonated with them. It was like, good. You know, I, something that I am doing is helping that, you know, that's what I was trying to achieve. Um, but my ability to help them recognize that they were realizing some of their goals made me feel good. So it's a reciprocal interaction. Questions you can ask. Uh, 
How does a <clears throat> tiny seed develop into a majestic tree? I would go out in the, each fall and I gather maple seeds. Um, Cause they're, you know, they've, they've got the little wings on them. They're pretty easy to spot, but they grow into these huge trees. And I will pass around and give everybody a seed and we will talk about how that seed develops into a majestic tree. And then we go on to talk about how a seed of what they're doing in treatment will help them develop into these skills and help them blossom, if you will, into the life that they want to have. How can rain and dark skies give to rainbows? You know, generally we think rain is icky um, and dark skies are, quote, depressing, but rainbows are so much more noticeable when they are against a backdrop of a dark gray sky. And, and again, we can use this as a metaphor for treatment. I, I love my metaphors, so <laughs> my clients get stuck with that a lot. But rain can be unpleasant things that happen and dark skies can be um, maybe unpleasant feelings. And then the rainbows are the hope that come out of that. And how does the contrast between the dark skies and the rainbows, how, how poignant is that? How, how do animals know what's toxic and what's not? I remember my donkey was going around and she was eating wood ash. We had burned some, uh, burned some wood. And she kept going over and eating the wood ash. And I couldn't find anywhere online whether it was good or bad for her, so I called the vet. And the vet's response was, well, must have something she needs or she wouldn't be eating it. Okay. <laughs> Not exactly the answer I was looking for, but basically his response was telling me that somehow in our brains and we have that same sense we may crave certain things when we have a nutritional deficiency or definitely when we eat something that is toxic um, or rotten we notice it we don't have to think about i wonder if this is rotten or not we taste it we know there's something in our brain that goes yeah spit that out um but it's interesting. How does our brain know this if it didn't know how long it had been in the refrigerator? What is unconditional love? This is another one that they can ponder um, because a lot of people have not experienced unconditional love. Um, and pondering the possibility, what would that be like to be loved unconditionally? To love unconditionally and some people um, do love unconditionally but they don't feel like they've ever received unconditional love um, and even imagining what it would feel like if somebody loved them unconditionally can be overwhelming what is one way someone positively impacted you today how has that impacted the way that you interacted with others felt or coped <clears throat> what is one way you've positively impacted someone else and how might that have started a chain reaction I love talking about the butterfly effect and basically the butterfly effect says that even the smallest action like the fl the um, flipping of a butterfly's wings creates a change in the environment that has ripple effects and even a small little action can have huge consequences sometimes good sometimes bad and and so we talk about that and I encourage you to think right now on on days where you have gotten up you've <clears throat> maybe gone to the gym you held the door for somebody you smiled at them you said good morning um, or they smiled at you and said good morning how did that affect how you interacted with the next person and how did that affect how that person interacted with the next person we can create a chain reaction uh, one of the things that 
I try to do when I go to the store is acknowledge people, especially, you know, the stalkers and stuff that are in the aisles. I try to acknowledge them, say good morning or good afternoon. You know, I don't get all up in their business and try to have this long discussion, but I, <clears throat> I make a point of acknowledge the, acknowledging them as human beings because so many other people have just walked past them like they didn't exist. And a lot of times it makes them smile. And that makes me happy. So it's not a huge thing. You know, it's not like a waterfall or a um, sunset, but it's one little thing. And then thinking about the reciprocal effect of that, um, that it could have, uh, can be awe-inspiring. And when we, a lot of times when we talk about random acts of kindness, I encourage people to think about the ripple effect. Yes, quote, all you did was pick up this piece of trash. But what are the effects of that? You picked up this piece of trash so people, when they walked by, didn't have to see it and think, ew, it's nasty. They saw the beauty of nature. You picked up this piece of trash so the little squirrel didn't get his head caught in it. So that was a really nice thing to do. You picked up this piece of trash. What is another effect of that? So it was a little action, but how big was the impact? Um, in what ways do your differences enhance the world? You know, we all have our differences. You know, I'm, we talked earlier about temperament and things like that, but encouraging people to look and see how does my uniqueness make the world a better place? Um, too often we're in our default mode and we miss opportunities to notice awe-inspiring experiences. Awe experiences can mean noticing something larger than you, as well as noticing how little things that we often overlook add up and impact us and the universe. Awe experiences can help us recognize progress, see possibilities, and connect in unique ways.